You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Good evening, folks. Tonight's episode is a rerun. Due to the great mass of bullshit poured out on Radio Freemasonry just prior to this program, we will expose this wolf in sheep's clothing in his own words. Tonight we're going to play a portion of a program that originally aired on June the 23rd, 1993. If after hearing tonight's program you wish to order that original broadcast, it is tape number 123 in our catalog. That's tape number 123 in our catalog. We discussed this rerun a little bit last night so you all know the subject. But you all need to hear it again, even those of you who heard it the first time that it was broadcast, and those of you, of course, who have never heard it and are struggling, attempting to understand the purpose of the hour of the time. We hope that this rebroadcast will bring some things into the forefront that have been lurking into the shadows and will make some of the conversation that you've heard on the hour of the time much clearer. We encourage you to order the original tape from the original broadcast on June 23, 1993, so that you may study its content in your home. Now, without further ado, we go in to the rebroadcast of the Mystery Exposé. At the end of this rerun, ladies and gentlemen, we will open the phones for your comments and questions. Now, folks, I'm going to take you into the mind of someone who has been an initiate, an adept, a priest of the Mystery School for many, many years. I'm not going to identify this person until the end of the program. I want you to see if you can guess who this person is and what this is all about. If you can, then you'll know instantly what this program is for, the reason behind it, and you'll be able to understand a little bit better how you've been manipulated for many, many years by the priest of the hidden religion called Mystery Babylon. And if you can't guess, then at the end of the show, you're going to be told, and you better be holding on to your chair because it just might knock you right out just might knock you right out. I'm going to quote from a book that this person wrote. This person uh, verified something that I wrote in my book, Behold a Pale Horse, and that is the calendar of the hidden religion of mystery Babylon. It's 6,000 years and it started in 4,000 BC and ends in the year 2000. Quote, the Great Pyramid System of Passages and Chambers is a chronological graph that begins in 4000 BC and continues for 6,000 years." Unquote. Now let's go to an interview that was conducted with this person by someone else, not by me. But I'm going to be reading to you word for word this entire interview, and this is going to take up most of the program but this is going to give you a glimpse into the personality, the religious beliefs of the priests of the mystery religion, and you'll see sort of how they try to disguise what they really believe behind this aura of wanting to further the evolution of mankind and create some kind of a world utopia, which they know in their heart is a lie to begin with. So, 
I'm going to call these number one and number two. Number one is the interviewer. Number two is the interviewee. Number one, how did you become interested in the Great Pyramid? Number two, well, like everyone else, for most of my life, I accepted the idea that the Great Pyramid was just a great big pile of stone made by thousands and thousands of slaves. But I read a book in 1967 called The Ultimate Frontier. That book profoundly affected my life. In it, they made statements about the Great Pyramid being much more than a tomb. Point in fact, it never was a tomb for a pharaoh. It is a monument to mankind and human perfection. It is the oldest artifact of an ancient system of religious belief. Then I thought, that's something I can check out. I can see if the information in the ultimate frontier is true or not. I started investigating. I then learned a great number of things about the Great Pyramid. First of all, the ancient Greeks were quite right in calling it the first wonder of the world. When one considers the thought, preparation, and choice of sight, one will see that the solid bedrock of the Giza Plateau, the only tableland within miles capable of supporting the weight of the structure, was the most intelligent choice. There is a fantastic amount of literature about the Great Pyramid. Therefore, it is not unusual that we also find a great deal of controversy surrounding it. The British in the 1860s were the first to study the ancient building in a serious manner by re-examining the theories of the British, which were discarded by the experts of that time, the crux of my book began to take shape. Number one, does the crux of your book include the fact that the Great Pyramid may not have been built by the ancient Egyptians? Number two, yes. The British did not discuss that possibility. That possibility is my own bit of research. However, most people who study the Great Pyramid realize that the civilization we know as ancient Egyptian could not have built the Great Pyramid the way we know today it would have had to have been built. You see, the building is built geometrically perfect, and according to our present conception of ancient history, the Egyptians didn't understand highly theoretical mathematics, obviously from the way the other 89 major pyramids in Egypt were constructed. The manner in which the other pyramids were constructed was a very haphazard way of building. They are copies of the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid itself is, however, absolute perfection in stone, both to the pi relationship, the relationship of a diameter to the circumference of a circle, and the golden mean, or phi relationship, with which we can divide a straight line so that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The reason why it was structured is embodied in the word itself, pyramid, which means lights and measures, that there are revelation types of lights. The word for pyramid used by the ancient Egyptians was glorious light, and the word has meaning that there are revelations in the measurements. If you pursue this hint, so to speak, you find out that the builders of the Great Pyramid are the same people that wrote the original text of the Old Testament, and they laid out their plan in the Great Pyramid as well as in the Scriptures. I hope, folks, you understand the significance of that one statement, and there's much, much more to come. Number one, who are these people? Number two, my opinion is they were what we call hexos or hyksos and we find traces of them throughout Mesoamerica, India, and the Middle East in the earliest of times. The Egyptians had two or three different waves of Hyksos rulers come in. The word Hyksos for many years was translated shepherd kings, which is a paradox. You see, looking at life the way we look at it today, how could a group who were non-warlike come into a land and take over and run things without any fighting? Yet they obviously did. And these ancient builders had a profound influence wherever they went. The years of research I've done tell me that the Hyksos were a group of people who had in their culture information stemming from a previous civilization. I think that our view of history, saying that it started in the cradle of civilization, in Egypt, and Mesopotamia, is wrong. The surviving evidence indicates both Egypt and Mesopotamia are actually later civilizations, remnants of a far, far greater early empire. And here, folks, we see in this person's philosophy the same philosophy that Hitler pursued. The myth of ancient Atlantis or Mu, 
if you will, an ancient civilization which, when it was destroyed, left behind a remnant, a surviving element of that race, which is a super race, more intelligent, smarter, more worthy than any other race on this earth, if you will, the master race. And if you understand the esoteric meaning of what you're hearing, you are hearing Nazi philosophy, National Socialism, Hitler's vision of world history. And when you find out who this person is and what he's doing now, we'll all come together. We continue. Number one, do you think the Hyksos race was a race chosen by some greater intelligence to impart a superior ideology to the rest of the human race? Number two, not so much chose, but actually chose themselves. All genius is self-appointed. I would say these people were a remnant from a previous culture, and they had something they wanted to do, and they embodied their thinking in their work, and they influenced people by their works. Folks, that's the Luciferian philosophy. Continuing. They came into the land, and there were already humans in the Nile Valley. But they came into the land in an unobtrusive and dexterous maneuver so as not to alarm the existing culture. They came in without fighting. They took the worst land. They didn't try to impress their knowledge on the others. They just did things in a better way. Soon the people in that area were paying attention to them. Once they gained the attention of the people, it didn't take very long before they were running everything because they did everything with better methodology, which is the way life ought to be. You ought to show by example. Number one, what happened then? Number two, fairly soon after arriving, they suggested to the people that as life was now so peaceful and harmonious, it would be a happy challenge to build a monument to the future to the future of mankind. In my opinion, the Hyksos philosophy and the philosophy of many modern people is identical in that human beings can be perfect if they work toward that end, and that is the heart and soul philosophy of Mystery Babylon, the mystery schools, that man himself will become God. Wait until you find out who this is. Number one. What happened to the ancient tribe, the Hyksos? Number two, I think they are still in existence today and have not died out, but have gone underground many thousands of years ago. What we call masonry, Freemasonry is an offshoot of the group that started out. The Hyksos group became what the ultimate frontier calls the Brotherhoods. These are a group of people who have knowledge about what it really means to be human. And folks, that implies that the rest of us are not, and that also is in direct line and in direct concert with the philosophy of the mystery religion of Babylon. You see, to them, we are all cattle, animals who have no intelligence. Continuing, these are a group of people who have knowledge about what it really means to be human, to be a human becoming, to grow toward human perfection. It's a philosophical thing. These people still exist. They still band together in groups here and there, and they show by doing. Again, their lifestyle shows that they really have a handle on what life is all about. They don't try to impress others with numbers or with what they know. They just live doing something they want to accomplish while they are here. We know in Egypt these people formed secret societies and that Pharaoh Akhenaten came up, quote, under the rose, unquote, out of one of these secret societies and took over the land of Egypt in a manner that forbids disclosure at a time in which the superficial popular theology left a want unsatisfied, which religion in a wider sense alone could supply. And there he has admitted that he knows, he knows the esoteric teachings of the mystery schools, their origin and their purpose. And if you've been listening from the beginning, now you know that this person is a priest of the mystery religion himself. Continuing, 
We know Alexander the Great wanted to get the knowledge of one of these ancient secret societies because he writes about it a great deal. Pythagoras consented to be circumcised in order to become one of the initiates of these secret societies, which are the Hyksos population carrying their knowledge of science and the universe and cosmology with them and keeping the truth secret so they wouldn't be persecuted and wiped out. You can imagine what society today would do to a group of people like this were they to perform certain ancient rituals in public. Look what they did to Akhenaten as soon as he was dead. They destroyed the city he built. Number one. That's right, they tried to. Number two, wipe out his name. Number one. Yes, because he taught there was only one God. Number two. The human tendency in the mass populace. Number one. When you use the term mass populace, are you referring to a group of people who have become undeveloped on account of a too pleasant or a too severe climate, or even from physiological or psychological causes? Number two, the phrase mass populace was a term used by the ancient ones, which usually refers to those in a populace, any populace, in any country, who sit back waiting for some savior to raise them up out of their misery. Recognize the venom directed at Christianity, folks? Number one, then you are referring to people who are merely living a conditioned response to their environment. Number two, yes, the human tendency in the mass populace is to tear things down rather than to reach up to the excellent, which brings everything down to mediocrity. We're doing that in this country today with our so-called standards from the federal government. Everything's got to be brought down. This is just another social indication of this tendency in human beings to bring things down to a lower level so it's easier instead of striving for excellence. The Hyksos people went after pleasing results and worked hard in this manner. They strove for excellence, and therefore they had to go underground to keep from being persecuted. In almost every case that we can trace, anyone that tried to bring the truth to man has been crucified or killed in some cruel or barbarous human ritual. And folks, for many years, that was exactly true. But this is not the true intent of these people, for if you also go back through history, you'll find that these are the people who have been behind every religious war, have been behind every revolution, have been behind and ad literally are the heart and soul of socialism and communism. And everywhere they go, death follows in a stench. Number one, do you know how the Great Pyramid was constructed? Number two, I leave that puzzle to the engineers, architects, and professors of physics who have researched and studied the building. No one at the present really knows. There are several suppositions, but since no one really knows, that mystery remains to be answered in the next 24 years. And since no one really knows, in my opinion, there's no such thing as an expert. Number one, in that case, how do you believe the Great Pyramid may have been constructed? Number two, my information from people who seem very knowledgeable says that they built in with water locks and floated the blocks into place. That's pretty hard to conceive of because they would have had to have been tremendous locks because the Great Pyramid is up on a plateau at least six miles from the banks of the Nile River. Water with a series of basins and pipes that match the corridor in the chamber system of the Great Pyramid's interior system embodies all the laws of hydraulic engineering. For example, the Great Pyramid's Grand Gallery is a perfect vacuum bottle. And this pumping system, which I explain in my book as I explore the research work of Edward J. Kunkel, author of the book Pharaoh's Pump. Well, folks, it's time to take our break. Don't go away. We'll be right back and continue with this revelation after this very short pause. Snap. Water. And we continue, folks. Number one, if this tribe of people, the Hyksos, caused the Great Pyramid to be constructed, did they know their message wouldn't be understood for thousands of years, or did they think that humans would grasp its meaning a little bit before that? Number two, I think it's quite apparent that they knew it would be grasped in the 20th century. I think that they laid it out so the core of their meaning would be picked up by those who really had the mathematical know-how. It wasn't until 1905 that we had the real understanding of gravitational astronomy, the astronomy involving the solar system and the movement of the Earth around the sun, down so pat that we had all the answers the builders of the Great Pyramid had. 
They knew as much or more about today's system of gravitational astronomy as we know. Number one, do you think this falls in line with a number of other theories that humans were at one time visited by supremely intelligent beings from other worlds? Number two, I don't accept that thesis. However, I believe that there is life probably on every little planetoid in the entire universe, life that is similar to ours, having a spiritual nature, but somewhat different in physical nature. No other beings from outer space ever came down here and cohabited with the apes, as Mr. Von Daniken would say. I would reject that thesis, but on the other hand, I would say we are indeed created by another intelligence far greater than this planet or even this solar system. You know, it's a funny thing. I was once an atheist. I went through most of my college days as an atheist. I went through most of my college days as an anthropologist and didn't believe in a creative theory at all. But after studying for many years, I was forced to accept the fact that I obviously had been created because it just didn't happen by chance. There's no way, I would say, that this theory that something in outer space came down and interfered is quite accurate in that respect. We are in the image of a creator of some kind that we can't even conceive. Therefore, we have the ability to do all kinds of fantastic things. I think there was a civilization 50,000 years ago in the Pacific, now underwater, that had in it achievements that we only think of today. Number one. Okay, just a minute. Let me backtrack here. At the beginning of the interview, you mentioned that you began your investigation of the Great Pyramid after you read The Ultimate Frontier. What's it all about? Number two. Oh, that's a big topic. The Ultimate Frontier ties together a history of this planet, the idea and purpose for mankind be a, being a part of it, and a philosophy of growth towards human perfection, and how this philosophy is what life is really all about. The truth of this was lost when the great civilization on the Pacific continent of Mu was destroyed by a sudden cataclysmic change on the crust of the earth 50,000 years ago. There are a group of individuals who call themselves the Brotherhoods, unobtrusively working to uplift mankind back to this ancient wisdom belief, and the Great Pyramid is indeed a monument to this particular Brotherhood. Number one, perhaps the truth is never lost. Perhaps as we evolve towards a true understanding of essentials, we suddenly find ourselves faced with a question where we discover that we have really understood nothing at all, and consequently have to begin learning all over again on a new and higher level. Perhaps the memory of the destruction of Mu and other catastrophic events is contained in the collective unconsciousness of man. Perhaps some humans, direct genetic descendants of the survivors of these cataclysmic events, carry in their bloodline a genetic mutation. Let me read that portion again, folks. Perhaps some humans, direct genetic descendants of the survivors of these cataclysmic events, carry in their bloodline a genetic mutation. Perhaps this genetic mutation was deeply imprinted into the central nervous system of some of our forebears who actually experienced and survived a sudden slippage in the Earth's tectonic plates or a supernova explosion. Such a genetic mutation passed in genetic structures or DNA from generation to generation may explain why some of us today are more acutely sensitive to subtle Earth tremors than our neighbors. In any case, this book, The Ultimate Frontier, started your mental processes working along these lines. Number two, ah, they were already working along this line, just like many peoples are without knowing about it. I had started into investigation of phenomena and mysticism on my own because my religious convictions couldn't answer my questions. Going to different churches and checking them out, I found, didn't answer my questions as to why I am. I've always wanted to know why. The human physiology is a remarkable thing. Why should it be? Why should we be different than the animals? Why should we have these philosophies when no other animals has philosophy? I studied many of the standard religions, but they couldn't answer my question to my satisfaction. I didn't like the idea of blind faith. I didn't like the idea of blind faith. To me, blind faith is irresponsible and unreasonable. Then I got into science and became an atheist. I was working on a master's degree in anthropology and found that, just like the churches, the information from the scientific side fell short. 
They can't answer all the questions. In fact, the more we learn, the more anomalies we have, and we realize how little we know. Then my son, who at the time was four and a half years old, nearly drowned. In fact, he did drown. He was full of salt water and unconscious for 45 minutes. He should by all rights have died. The year was 1960. I was eating at a restaurant on the beach when I saw him floating face down in the water. I ran across the beach, jumped into the water, handed him to my brother, who handed him to a strange old man who appeared to be a derelict. When this old man pumped out the water, I was in shock. One of my son for the next 45 minutes. He refused to give my son to the ambulance crew and the doctor who arrived and pronounced him dead. The old man looked into my eyes and said, This boy isn't dead. I'm going to bring him back. I told the doctor, Let him keep trying. And the old man kept working. Forty-five minutes is a long period of time to remain unconscious without breathing. However, my son not only recovered without brain damage from that episode, but he told us in the hospital exactly all of the events that took place from me running out of that restaurant, jumping across the breakwater, diving into the water, and getting him, handing him up to my brother. He recalled all of this as if he had been watching it as a spectator, and yet he was unconscious. I mean, he wasn't Gene Dixon or anything. That personal experience was positive proof in my mind that the human mind is a lot greater than that body. Number one, did it reinforce a previous belief? Or did it really serve to allow you to see for the first time that there are other realities? Number two, it made me relook at some of my own experiences. It made me stop and think about a lot of things. For instance, the first thing it made me think of is when I was studying anthropology. I was studying the theory of evolution, chance evolution, chemistry, just providing a scenario for itself to keep procreating and surviving and improving and so on. If we accept evolution as the ultimate answer, we have to accept a ludicrous notion that atoms, all matter, is made up of the atomic elements, can so arrange themselves as to be able to give themselves abstract qualities such as memory, desire, will, curiosity, consciousness, conscience, creativity, intuition, emotion, and reason. How can you get that chemically? You can't. It has to be something else that is endowed, and man is the only one that has it. A goat doesn't see the stars or know what's over the mountain or know anything about life and death. You see, but we do. These ideas were in my head, and intuitively I knew there was much more. But when that happened to my son, I realized that I, too, am a discrete bundle of mental energy. Only I didn't have that phraseology for it. I didn't know about what life was all about as I feel I do now. Number one. Were you able to determine the capability of the human being to deal with all these diverse areas of knowledge? Number two, certainly I'm doing it and I'm nothing extraordinary. I am dealing with all of these areas of knowledge in a relaxed and causal and fun way. And I feel that I am growing. I am not impatient about my growth because I know that someday, if I continue to try to improve myself, if I continue to use those qualities of mind that I have, then I will become as perfect as humanely possible. Now, according to our basic beliefs in this country, human beings are created in the image of their creator. To me, that means we have the same qualities of mind. We're certainly not the physical image, but the mental image. We have will, memory, desire, curiosity, consciousness, creativity, conscience. I've gone through those before. Intuition, emotion, reason. Those ten qualities of mind are the same qualities as the Creator has. Perhaps we can never become absolute perfection as the Creator. Whatever it is must have been. I cannot conceive of the creative force, not enough to verbalize it and make sense to everyone, but I think we can obtain relative perfection and become one with the Creator by improving ourselves based upon what we have to work with. There's no limit to human abilities, to what humans can do. We limit ourselves by our own conditioning. Number one, do you think that most people are really trying to find out about all these things? Number two, many humans are. I would say there are millions of people who have an inner urging towards something better, especially in this day and age, because now there are more of them here. Out of the great majority, roughly 220 million people today in the United States, only about two or three million are really interested in what makes them tick.
what is involved in life, the purpose of it all, and in really growing and building on their character. The other 200 and something million are merely living a conditioned response from their environment, and they don't think about it at all. Look, here we are in the city of Atlanta, a huge city. Look at the people walking back and forth. They're positive in many ways, and yet they never really give it a thought as to why they are, why they're capable of building these tremendous buildings and driving those tremendous vehicles they drive. And Catholicism has been losing quite a few members because those members say that their religion is not in tune with the times, and this is the case in many other religious bodies. Do you believe that formal religion is just not keeping in tune with the times, or has it ever been in tune with them? Number two. Oh, considerably in tune. Essentially, it's this. The church for the last 2,000 years has done a remarkable job with what it's had to work with. Remember, they're dealing with part of the truth part of the truth. I've just finished this week a new book called The Life and Death of Planet Earth. Now what it points out is that the absolute truth is what we're all trying to find out and we prove this subjectively. We know it and nobody can change our minds. Because we know it just like I know that fire burns my fingers because I've stuck them in there. You can tell me all you want, but I won't believe it until I do it. Knowledge is what we're seeking. The churches started off with a paradigm, a framework of understanding, and they had to work within that framework, and their framework was quite narrow. Then Jesus came along and broadened it tremendously. He resurrected the ideas of love and brotherhood and working, you too can do as I do. He was showing by his lifestyle that you can be perfect. You can know yourself. You can know your creator. You can know what it's all about. All you have to do is get off the dime and stop being so lazy and pay attention. That's what he was saying. Human beings have a tendency to want to put frameworks around things so they can be comfortable with them. So the early church put a framework around the truth. Theologians have translated and interpreted what has been said by all the great teachers until it's been quite distorted. However, even with all of the translations and misinterpretations of what was really said in the ancient times, they've done a remarkable job. They've done some bad things as well as good things in the eye of history. But the information is here. All you have to do is want it and dig for it. I found it. I found it for myself. There's more than one path. The reason I followed the path of the Great Pyramid is because I'm a doubter, a skeptic, and there's something made of stone, the world's largest stone structure. It can be checked and rechecked and measured and remeasured. It's been around for a very, very long time, and there's no doubt it's there. However, the metaphysical idea, somebody going into a trance and some voice talking through him telling me he's Jesus, that doesn't prove anything to me. It could be, but I could never prove it. I can prove what the Great Pyramid does, and that turned me on. There are answers to everyone's questions. We each have progressed, you see. I accept we've lived many thousands of lifetimes. Let me repeat that. I accept we've lived many thousands of lifetimes. People say, oh, reincarnation, I can't believe that. Well, they probably didn't believe it in their last lifetime either. I probably didn't either. However, each time we live a life, we learn something more towards this perfection this perfection. We're supposed to be growing until finally we reach a point where we choose our incarnation with such great care that we incarnate to two very sharp parents at which point we grow with a tremendous rate of speed. That's the purpose of it all. Civilization's purpose is to provide the playground, the background, the environment that enhances soul growth, character growth, an environment which enhances the ability of humans to practice the virtues by practicing these virtues, love, brotherhood, and working, you too can do as I do, which are part of universal law. What you put out comes back to you, karma. You set an example for others by practicing patience, tolerance, forbearance, kindness, and charity. In your everyday life, you grow. By your example, you set off a multitude of self-sustaining series of events, a chain reaction which strengthens the truth. I found this for myself. This is the message in all of the esoteric teachings in all seven of the great religions. I think the key, the key thing that the present human civilization is missing, is that the idea has been lost that we're all responsible. Individual responsibility has been lost. We want some wizard to come along and do it for us. 
We want the preacher on Sunday to save us from our sins. We want the man in the confessional booth to cleanse us. We don't want to do it for ourselves. Well, there are no wizards. Every single ego, every single created individual or discrete bundle of mental energy must do it for himself. This is part of the message of the Great Pyramid, and as soon as humans realize this and take responsibility for their actions, the problems of the planet Earth will be diminished a thousandfold. Number one, I found it most fascinating the fact you mentioned a moment ago that the individual ego has a hand in the choice of his or her own incarnated person. Number two, this is esoteric information. I use the term esoteric information. Esoteric meaning inside, inside information, and it's only information that has been given to me. I have not proven it yet. Even if I did prove it, it would still be only information to you. So the difference between information and knowledge is clear. We need to make that clear. Now, my information is that each of us chooses our parents and our station and our situation, even our race. Listen to this, folks. Listen to this crap. Beginning again. One of the individuals that I have been told about in this esoteric information was George Washington Carver, who deliberately incarnated into a race that was downtrodden to work on the idea of bringing them up. He was an ego of tremendous advancement, and when he did incarnate into that environment, which was a terrible environment, I understand he may have lost a few points because he became embittered near the end. Had he remained without bitterness, he would have gained. This is the story I have. We all take a chance incarnating into a civilization that can drag us down, because when you get inside of a physical body, you become subject to the nuisances of that animal body and the conditioning and the responses, and it's up to you with those ten qualities of mind to overcome those. That's why being well disciplined is vitally important and permissiveness is not wise. Well, folks, there's no way I'm going to be able to read to you all of this interview because it's just too long. So I'm going to pick out some pertinent uh, points. This is number two talking. Uh, and this is an excerpt from a paragraph. However, don't permit it. Don't say laziness is good for everybody because you won't get uptight if you're lazy. We have so many errors on the idea of human potential and what to do with it. I believe in being well disciplined but not cruelly. I believe in responsibility in the organization I belong to. The Stell Group. The Stell Group. The group in which Lars Hansen was reared. Now I want to quote to you from a book called The New World Order by A. Ralph Epperson, which you can order from Publius Press in Tucson, Arizona. On page 67 in The New World Order, Mr. A. Ralph Epperson has a direct quote from Eklal Kushana. He was the leader of the Stell Group. Mr. Tex Mars also has the same quote in one or two of his books. But I'm taking this from the New World Order by A. Ralph Epperson. Quote, Lucifer is the head of a secret brotherhood of spirits. The brotherhood is named after Lucifer because the great angel Lucifer has been responsible for the abolishment of Eden in order that men could begin on the road to a spiritual advancement. Unquote. That is the teachings of the leader of the Stell group, the group that this man belongs to. So, folks, pay attention. This again is number two, speaking. This is a part of the message, a band of men at the dawning of the age of Taurus, a more civilized age embodied in the Great Pyramid's mathematical code to transmit to a generation of humans living in the age of Aquarius, something they felt was vitally important. The age of Aquarius began 23 August 1953, and this is a new age idea, the idea that we can perceive and try to improve. Of course, there's still a larger majority of humans, even in the age of Aquarius, that want to drag people down and lower the standards. However, every single ego, every single human, has the capabilities of bringing himself up to the equal of his creator. It's just a matter of effort and patience and practicing the virtues. Number one, as Jesus stood between the two columns, Jachin and Boaz, on the outer porch of King Solomon's temple, 
John 10, verse 23. On 25th December, the celebration of the winter solstice, which is what that date is really for, a large majority of the people did not understand him when he said, Ye are gods. John 10, verse 34. Some people in the crowd took up stones to kill him as a money changer in the temple, cocked his head away from his table to see what some in the crowd were yelling about. He heard Jesus say, Is it not written in your law, I said ye are gods, as he saw a lawgiver of the temple sit bolt upright to listen to this man speaking to the crowd? The money changer wondered why such an important lawgiver of the temple sat up to listen, as rigid as a rod of iron, remembering the law and his responsibility, as the lawgiver remembered Psalm 82, verse 6. He remembered a song of Asaph, in which God said, Ye are gods. The man speaking to the crowd said, The Father is in me, and I in him. And what he meant could not have been other than what he said. As the crowd screamed blasphemy and moved forward to kill Jesus, he simply disappeared. So when you say humans have the capability to bring themselves up to the equal of their creator, it would seem to me that this new age idea is in reality a very, very ancient idea. However, you did say that this was part of the message of the Great Pyramid. But what about these ancient brotherhoods, these people who are responsible for all this secret type of teaching, which seems to be such a mystical notion? Are they still around today? Number two, I think so very much. In fact, I could say, I know it. You could say it's information now. The brothers are those individuals who have obtained a degree of advancement over other humans. This also is number two. If you meet a brother and you get him alone and you say, I've noticed about you certain things and I want to ask if you are familiar with the Rosicrucians or the Masons or the Stell Group or the book, The Ultimate Frontier, or some of these metaphysical philosophies, you, when you ask, are allowing him to interfere in your environment. This is the teacher appearing when the student is ready, but unless you ask, the brothers won't help. And here's the crux, folks. Number two. Yes, the fifth level of intelligence is responsible for the direct work with the planet, and they can make mistakes. The story of Lucifer and Jehovah is a tale of the mistake made by the angelic intelligence. The argument between the angelic forces on the fifth level of existence is that Jehovah, according to my philosophy, believed that humans could advance with a perfect environment, so at first humans were given the Edenic state. All they had to do was eat bananas, sleep, chase the girls, make love, swim, sun, and sleep. But they didn't grow in that Edenic state. They were lazy. All they wanted to do was eat, drink, make love, and sleep some more. They didn't want to grow. So Lucifer said, we should help mankind grow. And you know the rules. We can't go down and do it for them, so we'll give them problems to overcome. And zap, like the thunderbolt of Zeus, Eden was gone, and we now have winters in Chicago, and man has to overcome. Now, folks, I don't care if this man worships Lucifer. I don't care if he believes what he believes or belongs to the mystery schools. You all know me. I believe in the Constitution and that we all have a right. But when he deceives and manipulates all of us, and when on June 8, 1993, on Radio Free America, he said to the world that I am a CIA disinformation agent, then it's time that you knew who this man really is. I want you to track down and read these books that he wrote, The Great Pyramid, Man's Monument to Man, New York, Pinnacle Books, 1975. The Life and Death of Planet Earth, New York, Pinnacle Books, 1977. Psychic Surgery, 1973, reprint edition, Chicago, Pocket Books, 1975. The entire text of the interview you heard tonight can be found in a book called 552000, Ice the Ultimate Disaster, by Richard W. Noon, spelled N-O-O-N-E, -O -O -E, and he was the interviewer number one. Folks, research the history of Willis Cardo. Research the history of the Liberty Lobby. And specifically, Radio Free America. Tom Valentine has been a member of the Stell Group for most of his life. He has also been closely connected to the Communist Party by his own admission. Wake up! The members, the high priests of the mystery schools, are enacting ordo ab chaos. Create enough chaos, and then they can step up and take control and establish order, the new world order. Now you know why on Radio Free America Tom Valentine gets so angry when someone questions Freemasonry. Now you know why he covers for the secret societies and for Freemasonry. And now you know why he's attacked me because I am the enemy of Mystery Babylon. And there you have it, folks. 
And yes, there you do have it, ladies and gentlemen. I want to read to you a letter that I received today, talk about synchronicity, from my good friend in Tucson, Arizona, A. Ralph Epperson. He says, and I quote, You might enjoy letting your listeners know about a quote I just found in a book entitled Legenda of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry for the Southern Jurisdiction of the United States, written by Albert Pike. This book was written by Mr. Pike in 1888, three years before he died, and was published by the 33rd Degree Council when they were in Charleston, South Carolina. This quote should settle the question once and for all as to who the god is that the Masons worship in their lodges. Here in Tucson, one of their lodges is called a cathedral, and another is called a temple, two words describing places of worship. This quote will prove concretely that the god they worship is not the god of the Bible. I have been looking for this book by Pike for many years, and presumed that it was out of print because I couldn't locate a copy. However, I knew it was not forgotten, because Rex Hutchins, then a 32nd degree Mason, but who later became a 33rd degree Mason, quoted from it in his Masonic book entitled A Bridge to Light. So I considered it fortunate when I found that a publisher of out-of-print and rare books called Kessinger Publishing Company in Keela, Montana, had reprinted it. It is their claim that Legenda is a series of monographs intended to supplement the ritualistic instruction of the book written by Mr. Pike called Morals and Dogma. As you know, the first ten words of the Bible are found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and are, quote, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, unquote. That means that in the time before there was something, there had to be nothing. So God created something out of nothing when he created the universe, or there would not have been a need for a beginning. But Mr. Pike does not agree. This is what he says on page 109 of Legenda in his explanation of the 28th degree. Quote, nothing is produced from nothing, because existence can no more cease to be than nothing can cease not to be. To say that the world came forth from nothing is to propose a monstrous absurdity. Everything that is proceeds from that which was, and consequently nothing of that which is can ever not be. The letter I in the word is was capitalized by Mr. Pike. It is customary to capitalize the first letter in the name of a deity or a noun that refers to a deity. Does this mean that he is making a deity out of matter? Well, folks, Lucifer is the god of the material world. So Mr. Pike says that those of us who believe in a God who created the universe out of nothing believe in a monstrous absurdity. The Christians and the Jews who believe in the God of the Old and New Testaments believe in a monstrous absurdity when they profess that their God created the universe out of nothing. Let there be no doubt, Pike told his readers that he and the Masons do not worship the Creator God. They worship a secret and concealed God in their cathedrals and temples who cannot create anything. In fact, Mr. Pike agreed with that statement. He wrote this about their, quote, sun god, unquote, on pages 253 and 254 of Morals and Dogma. I might remind you that Radio Free America is carried by the Sun Radio Network. Quote, Amun, at first the god of Lower Egypt, was the sun god. He created nothing, unquote. And to show that this is true, he repeated the idea on page 281. Quote, the supreme being of the Egyptians was Amun, a secret and concealed god, the original light. He creates nothing, unquote. Yet he calls this god the supreme being. If the universe had two gods, one who created everything from nothing, and one who created nothing, I would presume the first god who made everything, including the second god, would be superior to the second god who created nothing. So the only way you can resolve this problem, if you believe in this second god who created nothing, is to claim that there is no creator god. Then your god can then become the supreme being. And that is what Mr. Pike did, make no mistake about it. The Masons do not worship the Creator God, the God who made the world out of nothing.
and that is why they have chosen to call their God the great architect of the universe, and that is why the Brotherhood in the ancient times was called the Builders, and today are called Free Masons, or Free Maisons in the French. It is known that architects do not draw plans to create a structure out of nothing. They design structures that must be built from existing materials, or, if you will, out of materials that must be changed from one form to another before they can be integrated into a structure. The Masons worship some other being, one that they know can create nothing, and that includes the Stell group. That includes the ancient order of the Rose and Cross, the Knights Templars, the sovereign and military order of the Knights of Malta, and all of the rest of these skunks. The number one Mason of all time has said it, ladies and gentlemen, in his own writings. I have never claimed that Tom Valentine was a Freemason. I have only claimed what you have heard in this broadcast tonight, and I am sick of his stinking lies, and I am sick and tired of you stupid sheeple out there who cannot study or listen or repeat exactly what you hear but have to make up some strange tale in order to cover your pathetic ignorance. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not attack people. I reveal them. I wish nobody ill will. I don't care what altar anyone worships upon. You are listening to a true constitutionalist who believes 100% in our right to protect us, the religion of our choice. I would fight for any one of you if that right were threatened to be taken away. Where I draw the line is when you lie, when you deceive, and when you manipulate the rest of us to pit us against each other so that you can bring about your silly, stupid utopia, your dream of a thousand years of peace on this earth. You will never do it because you are mankind just like me and everyone else who you claim are nothing but cattle. And because you are man just like me and everyone else, you suffer for the same inherent failings that I and everybody else who lives upon this earth suffers from. You have the same temptations and the same greed and you fight every day against these things. And to say that you, you are the only truly mature minds in this world and that you are going to control the rest of us because we do not have the capability or the power to think for ourselves is not only ludicrous but is what eventually will bring you to your knees as we round you up and throw you in the jails and the prisons where you belong and stop your wrecking of all the good that man has built upon the face of this earth. Don't pervert my words because I'm the only one you'll ever hear on the radio who uses fact, who uses the own words of the people that I talk about and I have no ulterior motive of trying to hurt anyone. The only reason for this broadcast and for me sitting here ladies and gentlemen, is to wake the sheeple, empower the people, and try, like hell, to save freedom for not only this country, but for the entire world. Now, if you cannot understand what you heard tonight, then you are one of the most stupid ones out there. Those of you who are sheeple, who think you understood but aren't quite sure, but you believe that you are getting some meaning from what you heard tonight, you have a chance. And of course, the rest of you, the people who have listened to the over 32 hours of the mystery series that we've aired on this program, you already know the truth. And you are the hope for the future in this nation. Ladies and gentlemen, I've said it before and I'll say it again. These people practice the Hegelian conflict, political resolution and they control both sides of each conflict Tom Valentine never said a word on his program about Freemasonry until I forced him to by my broadcasts and if you don't believe that you go back and listen to all the tapes remember a nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence. Such people are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent. Shortly after I originally ran this program, Tom Valentine came on with the master of the Stell Group and claimed that he became a Christian in 1968 and left the Stell Group forever. 
and that is a lie because in the interview that you just heard he claimed that he was loyal to the group to which he belonged the Stell group that interview was conducted in 1976 and that book was published in 1982 I've said it before I will say it again Tom Valentine you are a liar and if you are not sue me we'll let a court of law determine it I have all the evidence I need mister all of you out there listening good night and whether you believe it or not I mean this from my heart God bless you all Thank you.